Welcome to part one of this four-part continuing education series. My name is Max Dodge. I'm a paramedic in New Hampshire and an EMS educator. This four-part series of short continuing education topics will cover the airway, respiration, and ventilation portion of the National Continuing Competency Program topics. Patients requiring airway management or ventilatory support are some of the most anxiety-producing calls we go on. The amount of uncertainty that we face as out-of-hospital providers is profound. We can't physically transport the kinds of equipment it would take to definitively diagnose and treat most of our acutely ill patients. So what can we do in the face of uncertainty? Well, the antidote to uncertainty is education. You're here for continuing education, maybe because you want to be, maybe because you have to get hours for recertification. Either way, I want to make this a worthwhile experience for you. My goal today is to advance your understanding of some of the things you probably already know a lot about. By the time you leave, I want to improve your intuitive understanding and reduce the burden of critical decision making when it comes to quickly and effectively managing a patient's airway or providing ventilatory support. So with that, let's move on to our first problem. We know that the body requires oxygen to complete the chemical processes that make energy. Without oxygen, energy production slows down to a trickle. Cells can't keep up with the metabolic demands of basic operation and we begin to die. This is the physiological basis of shock. Fortunately, we can bring fresh air into our lungs through the process of ventilation. And we can also pump blood from our heart into our lungs to pick up that oxygen in a process called perfusion. But this process is a little bit more complicated than we think. So how do we make sure the amount of ventilation and the amount of perfusion are matched up so we can absorb the oxygen our body needs? To answer that, we need to start off with an overview of the anatomy of the respiratory system. On the screen, we have an anterior view of the lungs with the bronchial tree and its divisions. In this diagram, the bronchial pulmonary segments of the lobes are different colors. We have the right, upper, middle, and lower, and the left, upper, and lower. Technically, the, the superior and inferior if we're using the correct medical terminology. If we zoom into the lungs, we see the branching pattern of the bronchi. Now we know that the trachea bifurcates or splits into two at the carina, and this creates the left and right main stem bronchi. And here we see the left main stem bronchus in the left lung. The cartilage plates and rings that we normally think surround the trachea also surround the bronchi and play the same role as the cartilage in the trachea to keep the airway passages open at all times. The bronchi pass through the visceral pleura of the lung that separates the lungs from the chest wall and the heart. Then, the bronchi begin to segment into smaller and smaller passages called bronchioles. All airway passages terminate into a pulmonary lobule filled with alveoli. When we zoom in even further, we can see one of these lobules and the clusters of alveoli that, surround our, that are surrounded by capillary blood vessels. Deoxygenated blood from the heart is pumped through these tiny blood vessels and across the surface of the alveoli. As blood cells float by the alveolus, oxygen molecules from the atmosphere bind to the proteins inside of the red blood cells, and carbon dioxide unbind and diffuse into the air sacs. This whole process is called gas exchange. Here's an even closer look at the structures of the lung. Lung is spongy, and most of, and most of it is composed of the air in the terminal ends of the airway, the alveoli. We can see some of the airway passages here in red circles. They're wrapped in smooth muscle and lined with mucus secreting cells. These are the parts that swell up during things like asthma attacks. We can also see the spongy alveoli packed in at the ends of every branch of the airway. Alveoli are wrapped in capillary beds and lined with super thin cells through which gas exchange takes place. Let's zoom in even farther. If we look at a cross section of the alveoli, we can get a sense for how all this works. But first, let's get our bearings here. At the top of the screen is a capillary blood vessel and at the bottom is an alveolus. That means the stuff in the blood vessel is mostly plasma and the stuff in the alveolus is mostly air. The cells that line the blood vessels are called endothelial cells. They play a role in making sure fluid doesn't leak into tissues and making sure immune cells behave themselves. 
the thin cells that form your alveoli are called pneumocytes. And specifically, these thin ones are called pneumocyte type 1, although that's not so important to remember right now. The other type of cell that lines the alveolus is called a pneumocyte type 2. Again, the name isn't as important as understanding the function. These, scales, these cells are scattered around the inside of the alveolus, and their job is to release surfactant. Surfactant is a mixture of proteins and fats that coat the inside of the alveoli air sacs and allow them to pop open whenever we take a deep breath. If we don't have surfactant, or if our surfactant is diluted, the walls of our alveoli would stick shut because the surface tension of water acts like glue at this microscopic level. This would make it really hard for you to take a full breath, and the muscles that are involved in breathing would need to work a lot harder. Between the endothelium of the capillaries and the thin cells of the alveoli is what's known as the fused basement membrane. What this means is that instead of the cells having their own cell membranes, something that almost every other cell in your body has, these ones share a membrane with the blood vessel cells. So if you're a firefighter, this would be like a party wall on a duplex. Both cells share a single wall. This allows gases like oxygen and other inhaled substances to easily pass from the lungs into the blood and dissolved gases like carbon dioxide in the blood to exit into the lungs. And finally, we have red blood cells passing through and picking up the oxygen. We'll talk more about how they work in just a bit. Okay, let's zoom back out a little bit and talk about how all this stuff works to keep us alive. As deoxygenated blood flows from the heart, it hits the alveolar capillary bed. The chemical conditions in the lungs are just right for oxygen molecules to be picked up. So oxygen molecules diffuse across the very thin shared membrane of the alveoli and the capillary, and then the proteins that carry oxygen inside the blood cell, called hemoglobin, hold on to the oxygen molecule. And so we see here in the animation, the little blue dot is diatomic oxygen binding to the heme group inside of a big hemoglobin protein. Under normal conditions, red blood cells saturate with oxygen very quickly and will pick up most of the oxygen they're going to carry long before they exit the alveolar capillary bed. So how does all this related to disordered breathing? To understand how it can all go wrong, let's set up a way to measure exactly how wrong it can get. So a normal, healthy, adult male heart pumping blood through normal, healthy, adult male pulmonary blood vessels will push around 5 to 8 liters of blood past the alveolar capillary bed per minute. Now keep in mind that 5 liters is the low end of resting and 8 liters is running wind sprints in the parking lot. The blood flowing past the alveoli picking up oxygen is referred to as perfusion and is abbreviated to the letter Q for reasons that are beyond me. I guess P was already taken and they had to move on to the next letter. Anyway, a normal, healthy, resting adult male will take in about 5 to 8 liters of air into the alveoli per minute. This is known as the minute volume. So again, keep in mind that 5 liters is the resting amount of air brought in, and 8 liters is what you'd breathe in if you were running a marathon. So we have a big range of volumes. The air moving in and out of the alveoli is referred to as ventilation and is abbreviated to the letter V, which makes a lot more sense. So looking at these numbers, we can see here that in a normal, healthy person, the ratio of ventilation to perfusion is just about one to one. So let's look at some ways we can mess this ratio up. First thing we're going to do is throw a clot into the lung, a pulmonary embolism, or PE. Because of the blockage, the deoxygenated blood is unable to reach the alveoli. Unlike in normal lungs, where blood flow is matched up pretty closely to the ventilation of air, a PE causes a redistribution of blood so that some areas of the lung have low ratios of ventilation to perfusion. What this means in practical terms is that the blood is no longer flowing past the alveolar capillary bed, and so it can't pick up oxygen or drop off CO2. It doesn't matter how much we ventilate this patient, the air can get in just fine. It's the lack of perfusion that's the problem. 
So we'd say that the minute volume is just fine, but the perfusion is bad, and therefore the VQ is mismatched. The next thing we'll do is make the alveolar capillary membrane much thicker. And this can happen for any number of reasons. Fluid could be forced into the alveoli following congestion from a left-sided heart failure. The cells of the alveoli could be damaged, by inf um, damaged or inflamed by infections. Those same infections can cause pneumonia, where pus or other fluid can build up inside the alveoli. Or genetic anomalies, like cystic fibrosis, can cause a buildup of thick, sticky mucus. Regardless of the cause, the membrane that was once thin and allowed oxygen to cross relatively easily is now thicker and more difficult to diffuse through. So as blood flows past the capillary bed, less oxygen is available to bind to the hemoglobin. This means either it takes longer for the blood cell to become fully saturated, or that it leaves the lungs not having gotten all the oxygen it could have. So here we would say the minute volume could be good, depending on how compliant the lungs are, but the perfusion is bad because we're not picking up enough oxygen. And so therefore, we would say the VQ ratio in this case would be mismatched. Finally, let's collapse the alveolus. This is a condition known as atelectasis, and this can occur for a lot of reasons. Your lungs could be compressed externally due to something like obesity, the gradual deflation of alveoli from laying flat on your back for a long time due to sickness or injury. This is a process called de-recruitment. The dilution of surfactant because inhaled fluids, poisons, or congestions are, are damaging the ability for your lungs to pop back open easily. We can see this in shallow breathing after breaking a rib because taking a deep breath hurts or even just not taking a deep breath for a while, which is why we occasionally sigh for no reason. There are a lot of reasons why your alveoli may be snapped shut. However, the end result is the same. The blood moving past the capillary bed is not picking up oxygen, so perfusion is bad. The air is not moving far enough into the lungs, one of the reasons we have atelectasis in the first place, so ventilation needs to be bad, and so, even though our ventilation or our VQ is matched here, it's still terrible. So what does this mean for us, and what can we do to fight atelectasis and de-recruitment? Well, we can start off by taking a deep breath occasionally. If this isn't possible, and our patients are beginning to uh, require artificial ventilation or positive pressure ventilation, we can ensure that we're delivering sufficient volumes of air with each breath. And, on top of that, we can use something called a positive end expiratory pressure valve, a PEEP valve, and these fit onto the BVM. So to recap, in this part, we talked about the structures of the respiratory system, all the way from the trachea down to the alveolar capillary membrane. We covered some of the functions of the alveolar structures and the blood cells that love them. We discussed the interface between air going in and out and blood going round and round. And we went over some examples of ventilation and perfusion problems. Check out the next part where we're going to discuss respiratory tidal volumes and how not to hurt your patients with ventilation.